Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm thrilled to see so many people in attendance, and um, I'd like to thank you all on behalf of UBC Press uh, for joining us today for what promises to be a very stimulating discussion. I'd also like to uh, thank several students who agreed to be audience participants. They include Rick Wallet, Dave Gertner, Michelle O'Brien, Benjamin Garrels, and Gabriel Hill. And we're delighted to be able to engage with the student body in this way at this event. I'd also like to acknowledge, as many of you know here, that we are on Musqueam, Pe Musqueam people's traditional territory, and we thank the Musqueam people. Uh, before we start, uh, I'd like to remind you to mute your cell phones or to turn them off. I'll also note that uh, you may have noticed the cameras. We have, uh, we'll be recording this event and posting a video on YouTube. So those who can't attend will be able to view it and you can return to this as well. I'd now like to introduce our moderator. So Link Kessler, whose indigenous ancestry is Oglala Lakota from the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, is the chair of the First Nation Studies program here at UBC the director of the First Nations House of Learning, and advisor to the President on Aboriginal Affairs. Since 2007, he has co-chaired a series of committees that developed and now track the implementation of UBC's Aboriginal Strategic Plan. He has also developed software for the simultaneous and searchable display of video and text, as his research in Indigenous Studies has focused on the relationship between changes in communications technology and concepts of knowledge, power, and identity. Link, over to you. Well, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here today and uh, to be introducing such um, distinguished and interesting uh, people to talk to us about uh, about the relationship between uh, court systems, um, oral culture, and, and modes of transmission, and literacy, and uh, the regimes in which it uh, structures knowledge. In uh, speaking about a time that's long ago and far away, uh, scholar Brian Stack and the implications of uh, literacy, the uh, language and models of interpretation in the 11th and 12th century noted the ways in which the increased use of writing changed the way in which courts at that time viewed oral testimony. Speaking of a time a little later than that, another scholar, Walter Ong, in an early work called uh, Ramus Method and the Decay of Dialogue, observed that the rise of print literacy had the effect of representing earlier categories of medieval thought, which were largely oral in their implementation, nearly opaque to Renaissance readers. They looked back on those systems as they were represented in print uh, and were unable to, con to uh, see the ways in which the former construction of knowledge and its, all of its sophistication and efficiency um, was able to function. Uh, to them, it looked simply as if um, the categories it worked with did not exist. In our more contemporary environment, the relationship and the, the ways in which societies view and understand each other's systems of encoding and transmitting knowledge is, uh, has those same features, that the categories of one system are often not so amenable to the understanding and representation of the categories of another. But in these circumstances, those relationships also occur within a highly politicized environment structured in the inequality of power. And in those circumstances, uh, we've seen this, the systems of traditional systems within communities uh, go through periods of extreme stress with institutional structures such as the residential schools, uh, which work to undermine their very basis. And yet, um, communities have sustained their systems. And those systems today uh, remain active in, dis in uh, deliberations surrounding territory, knowledge, power, and authority. The complex ways in which these relationships are structured is what we're here to think about today. And we're really fortunate to have uh, three 
uh, quite expert people to help us think through that and also to bring in uh, the many other experts that they have had contact with as they have worked to understand these complicated topics. Um, Sophie McCall is an associate pr professor at Simon Fraser University um, in the English department and the author of First Person Plural, a book that looks at the ways, uh, among other things, I think the ways in which uh, narratives move across domains as, um, as they are represented um, in uh, across cultural contexts. Uh, Bruce Miller, who is, uh, has written um, Looking at these incredibly modest biographies that speakers have given me. Uh, Bruce is a professor of anthropology here at UBC and is the author and editor of six books about indigenous people and their relations with the state. He sometimes serves as an expert witness in indigenous litigation in Canada and the US, including UB, the BC human rights case of Raddick and Henderson regarding the rights of Aboriginal people to move in public spaces. And his most recent book is Oral History on Trial, which looks at the way in which um, oral history is used in court cases and the ways in which um, those um, the ways in which the courts have acknowledged oral history but uh, left it to um, subsequent um, contested areas to define what that acknowledgement means in practice. Uh, and also, I think in, in uh, both of the, our authors' work, the ways in which um, different uh, discourses um, work to define the field of thinking about uh, oral history and its placement um, across many different disciplines uh, informs um, those practices. And finally, to uh, Darlene Johnson, uh, who is an associate professor here in uh, UBC's Faculty of Law, brings both theoretical and practical perspectives to our understanding of these matters. After completing her law degree at the University of Toronto, Darlene spent a decade as land claims research coordinator for her community, the Chippewas of Nawash First Nation. Her advocacy contributed to the judicial recognition of her people's treaty right to commercial fishery and to the recovery and protection of burial grounds and other culturally significant sites within their traditional territory. In 2001, Darlene returned to the University of Toronto to obtain her Master of Laws degree, where she stayed on there to teach and earn tenure. Professor Johnson joined UBC in 2009, where she teaches in the areas of Canadian Aboriginal rights law and Indigenous legal traditions. We've asked that each of our panelists today um, begin with giving a short statement um, that it reflects some of their recent work and their perspectives on this field, and then we'll have a discussion with them. And there will, of course, be time for questions at the end of um, at the end of our time today. So I hope as you are hearing people's presentation, um, you think about um, those issues which, on which you would most like to hear further discussion for the question period. Thanks, Link. I'm Bruce Miller, uh, as Link mentioned. I, I just want to say, I think we've got two or three minutes, so I just want to simply tell you why I'm here. And uh, some years ago, seven or eight, maybe nine years ago or something, a uh, legal historian that I knew uh, challenged me repeatedly about my discipline, anthropology, and how we were representing oral histories in federal courts. Can you hear me? Okay. And uh, the, the higher. Okay. And uh, I uh, put them off for a very long time. I didn't want to do that. And eventually I did do that. And uh, got engaged in three uh, major lawsuits here in Canada. And what I did was looked at what the Crown position was. And I read thousands of pages of Crown materials in expert reports and in exam uh, cross examination and so forth. <clears throat> uh, because following Delgamook decision in 1997, um, the Supreme Court ruled that oral histories would have equal footing, was the term, with history. And uh, then the question became, how should that work? What, what does that really mean? And the Crown, which defends Canada in litigation against First Nations, got busy 
producing an approach to it which I came to believe was not helpful. And uh, so all of those ideas were part of uh, my production of this book, Oral History on Trial. And I wanted to do a couple things. I, I wanted to show to the uh, legal profession a different vision of who oral historians are and, and what oral histories are. That's one thing. And I wanted to say to First Nations, here's some insight into what the Crown has been doing and how what their approach has been to this topic. And um, the, the other thing is one of the key arguments the Crown made was that oral histories in court are written on uh, paper and become documents amenable to uh, standard historiographic methods. They're transformed. So I thought, what really happens from the mouth into the archives and into the courtroom? And I followed that train. That I followed that track all the way through in different parts of my, um, my book. And um, that was a long journey and it's a kind of a painful one. And now the, the, the major point of my book was to say, let's have a discussion outside of adversarial justice about how this ought to be done. And in my book, I talk about some ways in the law that this might be thought of. Uh, that's up to the legal professionals and legal scholars to advance further. That's their domain. And also, it's interesting that uh, we have Sophie here from literature to take up that topic. And that's our, uh, that's our task for today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for, for being here. Yeah, just to pick up on Bruce's point about uh, he wanted to know what oral histories are. And um, I take as a starting point uh, Julie Cruikshank's insight that storytelling uh, as an act is first and foremost an exchange between two or more people. Storytelling does not occur in a vacuum, nor does it stand alone. Rather, it is given meaning through the context of the larger cultural experiences that surround it. So in my book, I look at a, a number of case studies, including the courts, in which this storytelling exchange must be bracketed and ignored in order for the stories to stand as fact, um, or they risk being dismissed as unreliable. Um, and the problem of translating oral traditions into statements of Aboriginal title or rights demonstrates how high the stakes can be in this debate. In spite of the groundbreaking case of Delgamook, which uh, uh, Professor Miller mentioned, saying that um, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada insisted that oral history must be accommodated and placed on equal footing with other kinds of historical evidence. Um, scholars have argued that actually the definitions about the evidentiary nature of oral history has narrowed since 1970, 1997. And oral history has been used in ever more circumscribed ways in court. Courts. So part of the problem lies in, in sort of the next step, how, how to, under, how to um, understand the process of this translation of oral histories into courtroom statements. And how is exactly the question, um, how you pass down stories is what oral histories is all about. What is that? What are the circumstances surrounding that telling? Um, and as a result, uh, the role of cultural interpreters, both outsider anthropologists and insider cultural bearers and elders, remains vague and I would argue they, are, they remain under suspicion. And I, I would suggest that this suspicion um, comes from a, a more general suspicion in the Western tradition of the very concept of, of mediated knowledge, of knowledge that, that, uh, that has uh, narrative frames or that is passed on through a numerous, numerous tellers. Um, and so the result is that judges are themselves taking on the role of uh, cultural dis 
translators deciding themselves which oral traditions are reliable and which are not. So my book um, comes up with this term, an ethics of collaborative authorship, and uh, as, as a way to perhaps um, contribute in some minor way um, to this debate about how to guide a litigation process. Um, so uh, in the context of literary studies, uh, collected oral histories have been published under the authorship of the collectors and the anthropologists. And, and today, things have changed, and Aboriginal storytellers are now acknowledged as authors themselves. And a much more robust process of collaboration has developed so that storytellers, writers, translators, editors can, can work on more equitable um, relations of power. Um, now, if we apply this to, this to the court, it may come across as somewhat naive um, that I uh, would suggest that uh, the concept of collaborative authorship could change the adversarial nature of, of a court proceeding, um, given um, how the court operates according to a very strict sense of right and wrong and guilty, not guilty, admissible and non-admissible. But I am encouraged by those more knowledgeable than myself on this panel um, that such a collaboration could offer a, a viable starting point. Um, collaboration means foregrounding and, ex and engaging with that storytelling exchange. It means creating the conditions for an intercultural dialogue in a more consensual conflict resolution process. Um, authorship means respecting who the stories belong to, to whom they have been told, and why they have been told. Um, and uh, so uh, Professor Miller, with his varied experience um, um, as an expert witness, as an anthropologist, and as a longtime listener of oral history, does remain hopeful that there is more room for a more collaborative process, both within and outside the court of law. And Professor Johnson has argued that if the court recognizes more meaningfully the protocols of storytelling within the traditions of, indige of particular indigenous nations, recognizing oral history as a form of cultural property, perhaps some common ground can be found. So, thank you. Annie Bojo, if I were to do a proper opening, I would use up all my time. <laughs> Um, but I would like to acknowledge um, that I am on uh, the traditional, ancestral, unceded uh, territory of the uh, of the Musqueam Nation, and um, I also want to acknowledge that this is not my land. I'm boring from Ted Chamberlain. This is not my land, and so I don't feel like I can tell you my stories. Um, it's not. Um, I haven't been invited. Uh, by the people whose land it is uh, to tell my stories. Um, although I do acknowledge a few Musqueam uh, members uh, in the uh, in the community. Um, again, if I were to follow protocol, I'd, I would introduce myself to you um, properly, um, really quickly. Now, Kwege Jiko, Kwege Ndijnikaz, Wabje Shin Ndodem, Nashing Ming Donjaba, Nishinabe Kwege Ndao. I come from a point of land that's surrounded by water. It's now called Georgian Bay. And um, I belong to the Martin clan. And um, I should confess that I have been an expert. I've been qualified, sorry. I've been qualified as an expert uh, witness in uh, four different times. Um, two, twice my intervention uh, led to some success, and twice it fell quite flat. So um, I. Uh, and I, I don't claim to have any um, particular uh, expertise, and um, I know that so much um, depends in in a setting, whether it's a public inquiry or a, 
cross-examination on discovery or a criminal trial because uh, your chief and community members have been charged with fishing over quota, um, that so very much depends on the judge. And an awful lot as well um, depends uh, on the lawyers. And so I felt really bad. Uh, there's a spot in Bruce's book where he quotes Ken Coates who says, <coughs> law schools are killing these communities. They're taking their best people and turning them into lawyers. <laughs> And I'm participating in the recruitment of some very good people. And um, part of what I, I understand my role as a teacher, as a law teacher, is uh, to encourage students not to oversell the promise of the law, in particular the promise of Section 35, and um, sort of a Hippocratic approach, which is uh, to try to do no harm as lawyers. I'm out of time, probably. Um, one of the things I wanted to uh, say about the dilemma, which Bruce also mentions, of um, putting elders uh, on the stand. Um, my um, grandmother um, passed away in 1980, but um, she has a younger brother who's still alive, my great uncle Fred, and um, he's in his late 90s now. And I would never, ever ask him to go on the stand, uh, even if he was much younger and didn't have health concerns, um, because he would be so affronted by the way he was treated, by the rudeness of the people. Um, he, he, he could not tolerate it. And um, Bruce mentioned sort of this notion of verbal aggression that lawyers practice and in the courtroom in, in particular. And it reminds me of some things I had to unlearn. I'd learned some verbal aggressiveness at law school and had to unlearn that when I went home to work in my community. Um, and to relearn the politeness protocols that our elders teach us just by the way they are in the world. And that's um, so why I had to learn not to point again unless I was using my lips, and um, uh, not to interrupt, and not to ask direct questions, if you have to ask a question at all, and um, not to contradict. And so when I tell students, if they're interested in Indigenous legal traditions, that in my tradition at least, there's a duty of non-contradiction, well, how can you be a lawyer? <laughs> and, and practice that. And I think one way of, of, of thinking about it is if we think of law as a form of persuasion, and we tend to think of argument, really, as the only way um, to persuade. And um, narrative has such enormous um, persuasive uh, power. And um, our language also, our languages um, have so much uh, power and, and teaching uh, available. Um, I'm not a first speaker of my language, um, but, but I am attempting um, to, to work with it. And so um, Sophie's uh, title for her book, uh, a First Person Plural, um, which is, I think, a lovely idea, um, it is a little bit more complicated in, in my ancestral language, which is Anishinaabemowin, um, because we have two first persons plural. We have an inclusive first person plural and an exclusive first person plural. So sometimes I will say we and exclude all you folks in the audience and just be talking about us academics here, but sometimes I say we, and I mean all of us, and that's actually absolutely clear every time someone says there's, there's we including us, we including the people being addressed, and we excluding the people being addressed. And to me that's such a sophisticated understanding of communication and um, dialogue, and um, that there is um, enormous um, power and politeness uh, in our languages and that that may be a road um, to persuasion. Miigwech, thank you. Um, I think that the, we've, we've had such interesting statements to begin with and I think the, um, 
this conversation can take a lot of different directions. And uh, I'm hoping we can just um, turn it loose and see where it goes. But I do have a question I'd like to start with. And um, I think one of the things that's uh, really interesting to think about in this context is the way in which uh, something like a written system is, is, and we can think of an example that's, you know, an, an obvious example, our, our library system, um, and the way in which its premise is um, that the books and that the system of uh, information that they constitute, the library itself, is a context for the information. And it's essentially an open context. It's, it's, it's a system in which that information is designed to be portable and to travel across domains. And of course, in textual systems now, uh, as they are ported onto the internet, they travel across even wider domains. Um, that's not typically the case. Um, with community systems and community traditions that are not only rooted in place, uh, but rooted in sets of relationships that surround their operation. And I think Sophie's given us a way to think about that uh, at the very beginning of her remarks by thinking of those kinds of transmissions as always involving relationships between specific people, even when they are things that are spoken, that are spoken in some larger sense, that they don't necessarily, they, they happen through an individual, but they may represent a, a broader pattern of speech that the individual is enacting. However, we think about those, they're happening in place. Um, and the place in which they are defined, in which their relationships are clarified and have power and meaning, are not the courtroom, not originally. And when they're transferred into that context, or when they are transcribed and then offered in the context of written documents in libraries, a really fundamental transformation has taken place in their status. Uh, and in that transformation, a whole sets of relationships become invisible. They vanish. How do we, uh, how do we contend with that situation and with the, uh, the image, in a sense, that Sophie began with, of dialogue, which presumes, in a sense, an interaction between people, when this transposition into the context of the courtroom is really not very dialogic at all? It does not presume that the court understands the circumstances of the oral testimony, or at least not well. It does presume that people who come into the courtroom must think very carefully about the context of the courtroom. So how do we think about the relationship between those very different contexts uh, and the way they can be brought into some kind of more productive alignment uh, or, or the prospects for the possibility of that? Okay. Uh, well, uh, many ideas are flashing through my mind here, but um, perhaps, uh, from what I understand, uh, the Delgamuk case um, did partially take place um, on uh, Iksan and Wet'suwet'en territory. And, um, and perhaps, uh, if not the court case itself, but perhaps uh, a more consensually based process of, of evidence gathering or of listening to oral stories could take place um, outside of the courtroom. Uh, and, and in that way, I think, as, as you described so powerfully, perhaps different relationships um, in that transmission of oral history could develop. If, uh, but then, of course, the problem immediately is created where you have uh, parallel systems. And, and I have heard uh, that criticism where um, uh, litigators come and listen politely uh, to songs, uh, <coughs> dances, or other, or other ceremonies. And then um, Aboriginal um, community members listen politely as lawyers present uh, color-coded maps, flow charts, pie charts, etc. And it le leads to, a, in a sense, of parallel system. Um, however, uh, <laughs> I've criticized my own suggestion, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> well, I've got one thing I want to add right at the start here, which is that the uh, common law system, 
please correct me if I'm wrong on this point, uh, is built on the notion of incorporating uh, a sub a subordinate or parallel legal traditions. And so there's a, uh, it's part of the practice, there, there's the potential for encountering and engaging Aboriginal legal orders here. Uh, uh, so that's just a cover idea. I mean, that's part of a thousand year of tradition in that system of law. Uh, just that point I want to make. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there's uh, many ways in which accommodate technical stuff, which I suppose I should leave to Darlene to tell us, but there's all kinds of technical accommodations that can occur that are being discussed. I should. I also want to say this. I'm, I'm transforming your question, Link. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there are lots of conversations going on on this. The Indigenous Bar Association has had a number of meetings. They've met with panels of judges. Uh, they're meeting with the Department of Justice. Uh, did I mention this? I, I attended a meeting on Lake Winnipeg a couple of years ago with them. They were people were really mad. They were actually talking about taking the position of withdrawing elders entirely, which isn't really a sustainable position. Uh, but um, so there are the, there are other conversations going on around this, and there's a whole lot of me of simple mechanisms which have been thought of to try to deal with this kind of. Stuff and one of them is, uh, and some of these things have actually been done in other jurisdictions previously. You can uh, have elders uh, swear out affidavits beforehand. They, you can have uh, prior meetings with attorneys to work out the terms of engagement, and, and so that they don't actually uh, potentially co even come into the courtroom. That's been done in other jurisdictions, and uh, we're an English common law system, so we can look at uh, practices in other jurisdictions, including the United States or Australia, and so forth. Um, so th I think the whole idea of accommodation of rules, I also want to back up and say one other thing about the topic generally. Am I blabbering too much? Uh, okay, tell me to stop. One of the key issues here is the hearsay rule. And so there's this uh, deep set idea in the English common law tradition that you get to cross examine somebody who's coming in and giving evidence who's not an expert. And so one of the big obstacles, you know, if you bring up this topic to a lawyer who doesn't deal with First Nations, they say, what are you talking about? How, what, how can you do that? When are we going to cross-examine that guy? Uh, however, in our own system of law, there are exceptions to the hearsay rule already worked out. And I'll just mention a couple of them. Uh, and I'm kind of getting away from what you were saying, but I, I wanted to say these things. Uh, one is there are reputation exceptions to hearsay rule. But these, this already exists as important practices. Uh, so you can try to determine the standing of somebody in their own community and uh, acknowledge that uh, they, they uh, can give what otherwise would be hearsay testimony. Uh, several people have noted the importance of oral footnoting. One of the characteristics of oral historians often is telling uh, the chain of information, how who they heard, who they learned from, and who that person learned from. And that took, uh, there was judicial notice of that in the case of R. V. Jacobs right here in British Columbia. And uh, several people have commented on the importance of that practice. And uh, Michael Ash brought up in an article uh, a few years ago the idea of ancient doc, doc, can there be an analogy from ancient documents concept, which is that documents past a certain age are thought to have truth because they've withstood the test of time in, in a place where they can be uh, critiqued. Uh, I didn't articulate that so well, but, uh, and, and we could have analogy to, um, now this has actually been tried, not successfully, but it could be tried again. So these are ways in which um, oral historians who might be elders or who might not be elders can uh, uh, talk in the courtroom, be, be given the grounds uh, to get around the hearsay rule. Now they, those things that I'm mentioning, they still would be cross-examined, but there are ways in which they, they could give, uh, they could get outside of, uh, of doing that. By the way, I, I'm just thinking about this for a moment. Uh, I, I was party to the Missing Women's Commission. I wrote a report which I withdrew. Uh, missing commission, missing missing women um, inquiry, and uh, I, I just thought of the formal setting in which women from the downtown east side were expected to come in and be hammered under horrible adverse cross examination in that setting. It's just so awful, and there's an you know the same kind of the parallels happening here. 
And you mentioned that in Delcomuk, people actually gave testimony in longhouses. And we, so there's a whole, whole bunch of, I'm going to stop, but there's a whole bunch of uh, procedures that could be engaged to, to get at all this. And it could be uh, considered, uh, you know, there isn't really a problem in our own system. They could be brought up. And to some extent, last point, this has happened, Justice Vickers in Chilcotin made the observation that local standards of reliability and validity by which an oral historian might speak could be engaged, understood, and uh, represented. And, and the thing is, it's all about creating context of these materials which the Crown had been engaged in erasing. But we could get, the, there is this capability or even a history of not erasing it. Boy, where did I end up there? <laughs> Thank you. The common law has been sort of touted as, um, you know, capable of incorporating uh, new um, influences and ideas and and based in its early days, the English common law of um, being the, actually the unwritten law and, and judges deciding matters based on local uh, traditions and, and ethics. And the danger, I think, in referring to the English common law is that, in a sense, it was indigenous to England. And we don't have English common law here. We have colonial common law. And there's a, there's a huge difference. And the colonial common law came to British Columbia by an act of reception, a proclamation that was issued by uh, someone named Douglas. Um, sorry, he's a governor, I think. But um, the idea of reception is that once somebody signs this proclamation, if they have the proper authority from somebody else a long way away, that, that suddenly what was understood as a juridical wasteland gets occupied. It's as though the court falls from the sky and lands in Victoria. And, and the books don't even need to travel. I mean, eventually Blackstone and a few others, you know, books do travel and you get some lawyers and some judges. But the idea is that that, that, that is capable of being invoked uh, in a colonial context, and then it lands fully formed, with a few exceptions around repugnancy and in, inappropriate inaptness for local situations. Um, so colonial common law operates differently than common law that developed in England. And one of the big problems, I think, in the courtroom is that Another idea of the common law, and I forget the Latin tag for it, is that one should never, a judge can't really decide a case in which he has an interest. <laughs> so all the judges in the Supreme Court of Canada have to live in the National Capital Region. The National Capital Region is the one place in Ontario where there's no treaty. The Supreme Court sits on unceded Algonquin land to suggest that non-Aboriginal judges don't have an interest in a ruling that they make on Aboriginal title is like, well, we can pretend that along with all these other things that we have to pretend. And so unless, you know, we could talk about dialogue too. The problem with being in a court is someone's the judge, right? And someone's the supplicant. And communities and elders have to accept that if they go in and the judge doesn't buy it, that that's the law. And I, I think it's getting harder and harder for communities to think, to, to submit, to submit to the sovereignty of the crown in the manner that it is protected by the courts. Because if the doctrine of reception is a bit of a fantasy, how about this idea that when a British representative in Washington, D.C. signed a treaty with an American representative, suddenly the British Crown gained sovereignty to all of British Columbia. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't even here on the mainland, right? I mean, it's like, well, if that isn't magic, I don't know what is. But, but those things we have to accept if we're going to go into their system and they have the power. 
And un unless there's some disinterested judge we could bring in from somewhere who's fluent in both traditions, that we might have a shot of fairness. But there's a reason why I'm not practicing. I think in the, at the end of what you just said, there's, you're, you highlight a couple of really interesting issues. One of them is the, the question of interest, and interest just in power terms, that people have an interest in the way, uh, the outcome of a case because of their social location and the way in which uh, social location in uh, disputes between indigenous and non-indigenous Canadians or the state have a, have a particular uh, kind of power dynamic in them that is um, perhaps not unique, but certainly characteristic. Uh, but the other issue that you touched upon right at the very end of that comment, and I think it's one that uh, informs uh, all that we've heard today uh, already, is that uh, there's a second question of, of power, and that, that is the one surrounding interpretation. In other words, not simply a ruling on what has been heard, but in uh, terms of how we are to understand the testimony that's been offered. And uh, when we're thinking about legal traditions that operate within a single cultural context, some of the rules of interpretation at least can be presumed to have a kind of, um, uh, well, transparency is probably too hopeful a concept, but at least some commonality. But in this case, we're really talking about um, information uh, from one uh, cultural tradition being presented in the uh, in the venue that's structured in another tradition, and the question of what that information means and how it is to be understood is very necessary to questions as to what happens with that information in adjudicating some particular issue. Um, the um, you know, thinking of just uh, beginning with the Dalgama case and the care with which and all the decisions that were made uh, among communities as to whether to present uh, oral stories, uh, the traditional stories, and how to present them and who should present them and under what circumstances. Very complex decisions uh, made in front of a judge who at the end of the first of the trial offered some very dismissive and um, re remarks that really showed no engagement with those questions, larger questions of interpretation, or at least not very much engagement with them. Uh, has that situation changed over time? Has, us, has practice developed and uh, a more sophisticated approach developed in courts to the notion of interpretation of this kind of submission of evidence. Um, and what do you think might be a way of developing a more uh, adequate context for those kind of interpretive decisions to be made? Want to start? <laughs> um, okay. Um, yeah, from what I gather in uh, the the court uh, decisions following Dalgamook is that um, this situation has not improved, and uh, uh, I believe uh, Professor Dar uh, Professor Johnson evoked um, a picture of of elders who are simply not willing to have uh, their legitimacy, uh, their authority, and, and how they know things um, being cross-examined. But it seems that uh, because uh, oral history is now, um, is now to be accommodated and put on an equal footing with other kinds of evidence, it seems that the, um, the arsenal of interpretive um, tactics are being turned ever more strongly on oral history. Um, so so uh, the other panelists perhaps uh, can speak more knowledgeably, knowledgeably about the specifics, but from what I understand, um, as much as uh, Delgamuk has helped um, um, uh, legitimize oral history, the, the tactics of of breaking apart that oral history into little sound bites and um, and radically transforming them in that process um, ha has become even more intense. In in uh, Professor Miller's book, he he describes 
a little bit the process uh, that oral histories undergo from um, the 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 culture bear the culture bearers statement um, and he, he creates this picture of crown researchers working 21 hours of the of the 24 hour clock um, trying to manhandle these bits of uh, of oral history to fit you know uh, some uh, a legal argument and so yeah that's perhaps the others can add okay well I'm not quite as pessimistic for two reasons. One is we can't afford to be and have a Canada. And second, there is some success in many venues. Uh, David Millward, a law professor now at, at uh, Manitoba, I think, has, ca has listed a number of cases in which Aboriginal oral evidence since Delgamook has been useful in uh, the court. And uh, I, I testified across the line in a major case called the United States versus Washington, in which uh, unexpectedly Judge Bolt uh, uh, um, ruled that a treaty there gave half the fishing catch to the Salish people of Puget Sound. And uh, I remember a law professor here, uh, Doug Saunders, came and spoke in one of my classes a number of years ago, just when he was retiring. He had been involved in this kind of work. And he, he wasn't totally pessimistic either, and he said that the good decisions come from judges who are about to retire. <laughs> they don't, they're not worried about uh, appeals courts or anything. But uh, also I want to say that in some communities where I work, they've had long-term, um, very long uh, patience around uh, one, one place I know they've had salmon, they've, salmon lunches for 75 years to um, earn money to hire a lawyer and finally won a case. Well, that's pretty good. And uh, there are, an, and as to Sophie's idea about, I, I think the, the legal scholars, the, as I read them, say that there's a mixed record since Delgamook. There's some positive developments and there's some negative developments. And people argue about, about the same case on those terms. Some of them are clearly very terrible and uh, uh, backwards and really miss the point, but um, I don't know, I still think there isn't really an alternative here. Um, and I'm kind of in between Lenore and John uh, in, in my disposition um, in the sense of um, not being quite as angry as Lenore but not being anywhere near as optimistic as John. And um, I had a student say in class the other day, an Aboriginal student from um, Quitsum, um, it's the third class she's had with me, and she tells the other students around the table, well, I'm used to being angry in Darlene's classes. Because <laughs> it, it makes us crazy. The law makes us crazy. And um, maybe it's because I teach in my constitutional law course, I only teach what the Supreme Court of Canada has done. Um, things have sure gone downhill since Sparrow. And we won our community fishing rights in 93. And I can tell you, I'm, I'm beyond certain that if Vanderpeet had come down, we would not have won. So um, to the extent that Delgamook may have opened doors, they've been slamming shut too. Anyone, you just have to read Marshall and Bernard. If you have any, any, any um, illusions about the openness of the court, the Supreme Court of Canada at least, to see Aboriginal law as a source of law in the context of Aboriginal title. And um, so, so I've seen a huge um, retraction uh, by the court and um, I thought I couldn't get madder at anyone than I was at Justice Lemaire um, for Vanderpeet, but <laughs> uh, I have. And who knows, you know, what may uh, await us uh, with um, waiting for Chilcotin to come down. Um, and uh, so for me, it's a series of losses.
And these losses affect all Aboriginal communities. And people take chances that they shouldn't take, and it hurts us on the ground. And um, that's why my main message to students is do no harm. Um, I have a couple of questions, and, um, and they're directed towards thinking again uh, about not just tracking the way in which decisions are reached in court, but the, the framing um, structures of knowledge in which and, and how they structure the arena. And I'm wondering uh, a couple of things. Um, one of them is uh, whether legal education, whether there's an obligation in legal education to begin to develop uh, the understanding of the profession at a higher uh, and a more sophisticated level in working with these questions. And I know that the UBC Law School recently, I believe, has changed the curriculum that all, all uh, law students must study Aboriginal law as one of the core subjects. Um, I don't yet know what that means. I'm not sure if, if it's uh, been clarified yet, but uh, is there a Canadian place for law the... law of Aboriginal rights. It's not Aboriginal law. Ah, okay. See. Section 35. Uh, that's an important we need the distinction. Other one. Um, is, is, is there a place for uh, thinking about the uh, nature and, and interpretation of oral history in legal education? And, uh, and a second question would be, um, it's obvious that the courts have uh, looked to academics for some uh, assistance of some sort, if that's the right word, in interpretation of um, oral history. Uh, there's obviously a sense in which uh, the experts in this history are the people in the communities who are in, uh, who have responsibility for those histories. Um, but the, we, we are talking about a um, a system in which cross-cultural interpretation is also important, in which there's been this kind of reliance on academics. And I'm, I'm also just wondering if we could enter into that as an area of exploration and part of our conversation as well. So first, any comments on, on legal education? And then secondly, more broadly, the question of academic uh, expert, expertise. Can I back up one, one thing to, sure. to say something about Darlene's comment? You know, it's interesting that the Indigenous Bar Association has said that their root, preferred route is not not the Supreme Court, but rather provincial court, because the old adage used to be uh, the more local the um, authority, the more punitive they were. But somehow we've managed to invert that old adage here in Canada. Just wanted to add that. And by the way, I also want to add, uh, really, by all rights, I should be very skeptical here, because I read all the stuff about the crown model of oral history and all the arguments being made, and I'll just maybe back you up, back up just for a moment on that, sorry, Link. Uh, one of, there was a whole lot of arguments that disempowered Aboriginal oral histories used in the, these various cases that you just referenced. One of the arguments was that if oral historians read uh, the histories and anthropologies of their communities, then they no longer could be, give testimony because they weren't independent sources of information. They're contaminated. Also, oral histories themselves are contaminated by, by oral histories from other parts of the world, especially if they have world motifs. The fact that the literature says clearly that a motif, it doesn't matter, there still can be local content entered into stories with world motifs. And so there was a whole series of arguments made like that. I discuss all of them in my book. I had to spend months reading this stuff. And uh, so, uh, arguably, I should fall with that line of point. And now on to legal education. There's a, there's a discussion of that in the literature. I don't think anybody knows whether legal education will have a, an effective role here. Can you educate judges about this? I write about that in this book too and look at different people's opinion. Are they simply, uh, the problem with McEachern was that he reproduced a 1950s schoolboy view of, of uh, Aboriginal people in Canada. Uh, and so several other people have commented on this. And uh, uh, so I don't know whether education can play, it's certainly it's not going to educate the entire bench, but there could be people who could benefit, I mean, don't we have to hope that we can make some progress? Um, anyhow.
Um, yes, so to respond to your question about the framing structures of knowledge, um, it, this offers an opportunity to open up the discussion a little bit beyond um, the law. Uh, of course, I, I don't know the status on whether what law students uh, should or are studying, but there is certainly um, a move. Uh, I mean, perhaps what we're th we're talking about right now is our strategies of decolonizing knowledge, and what many venues can that process take place on? I, uh, there is the, the our academic institutions, and um, the 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 move to indigenize. Um, the, the humanities or in, indigenize all sorts of different fields of study um, is going on at this time. And all of our disciplines um, must think about what indigenizing our disciplines would, would result in. So uh, also uh, leading from something like um, a, a land claims case, the, the community-based process of, of gathering stories and place names and figuring out territory boundaries and so on is such an extraordinary process and the end result whether whether it's successful or not in court is that a nation or a community has this e extraordinary um, bank of, of stories and and knowledge uh, from the uh, from all members of the community and and that surely contributes to an idea of decolonizing uh, knowledge. Um, in uh, other, other pro, um, projects may develop from something like uh, community-based land claims uh, uh, research. Um, books may be, may be published of, of the stories from the communities, and certainly that has happened uh, in numerous contexts, not only relating to litigation, but uh, for example, the the stories collected for the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples um, spawned uh, community-based projects of, of publishing community stories. So I'm happy that you asked about the framing structures of knowledge because it allows us to open up the discussion to other ways that um, um, gathering stories might contribute to a larger pro project of decolonizing knowledge. I went um, back to um, university to have a chance to do some writing and and to stop bearing the weight of responsibility for the years and millions of dollars that my community was spending on a land claim that I became more and more convinced. Um, the odds were getting worse as time went on, just in terms of what the Supreme Court of Canada was doing. Um, but then after a while of teaching, I was thinking, what am I doing here? <laughs> and, so, and so I struggle with this, you know, question about not being too pessimistic. And so, I mean, the, the, one of the main reasons I left Toronto to come to BC is I thought, oh, things will be different in British Columbia. <laughs> They've got to be. Just take a look at the airport, right? I mean, <laughs> no, one's, no one's pretending that Aboriginal title doesn't exist or that Aboriginal people aren't here and weren't here first um, until you get to the law school. No, did I say that? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so. Uh, Imagine my shock when I uh, discovered um, that some of the people who were teaching constitutional law at um, UBC didn't teach Section 35, which is part of the Constitution now. And and then, so if students wanted to learn about Section 35, they would take it in an upper year course. And actually, there were fewer students in the upper year course here at UBC than I had at the University of Toronto. And I thought, am I in Vancouver? Am I in British Columbia? It's like these people don't know where they are. <coughs> and so we had, yes, a big fight <laughs> uh, 
which we won. Um, it's not about winning and losing. No, of course it is. <laughs> um, just, just in the last few weeks, um, to say, sorry, but every first year student in the University of British Columbia has to learn about Section 35, which says that the Aboriginal and Treaty Rights of the Aboriginal Peoples of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. It's been 30 years in April since the Queen signed something to that effect. And we're just now saying it's not okay not to teach it. So we have a long way to go, and I, judicial education, I think, is a contradiction <laughs> in terms. Um, at a certain age, I think people are, are not open to learning. Not all judges, but there's something called judgeitis. Anyway, they're used to judging, right? That's what they do. They judge, and um, and so I, I I give I don't have any hope for judicial education. I mean, I hope I live long enough to see an Aboriginal judge on the Supreme Court of Canada, and that would just be one out of nine, right? We have a long way to go. Oh, I've got a comment. You got to get them young. So I actually ran a little experiment on this in the law school. And somebody had made the claim that anthropology students and law students are inherently different in their backgrounds. And I showed him a film called Dead Birds, an old anthropology classic. And somebody had written a piece saying that the law students would respond by looking at this uh, this symbolic warfare by saying it's a situation of uh, a lawlessness and they need uh, the rule of law. And anthropology students would critique it from the viewpoint of framing the piece, you know, the uh, from a literary <laughs> stance. And what I found was that actually the young law students were kind of like the anthropology students. They they came from liberal arts backgrounds and so forth. And uh, anyhow, I, I'm not really trying to be facetious, although you make it sound like that now. Uh, one other idea here on a different vein. This sounds kind of wacky, but um, there are actually similarities between significant components of Aboriginal thought and legal thought uh, around the idea of what constitutes a fact or a truth. Uh, in the law, it's concrete and specific, and, and actually these are narratives that people craft in the law to win law cases. They come up with a, with a story, and the, the facts they contain are specific and concrete. They're not abstract and theoretical. And legal facts are specific like that. And one could say that uh, Aboriginal notions of science and so forth have that same specificity, concreteness, and, and narrative structure. So if we look at those things that are in common that might potentially be points of, of, of uh, overlap, which could possibly be built on by the right kind of somebody who could, some people in the law could do this, uh, there's some little, some little bit of possibility, I, I think. I'm wondering if it might not be a good idea to move uh, towards a little bit of questions at this point. And um, we will have some time for general questions, but I've also been told that there, is a, uh, there are some students here today who um, ha are doing work in these particular areas and might have some questions to pose perhaps first to the panel. Is that, is that true? <laughs> are you here today, students? Would, would you like to uh, pose your question and why not use the podium so people can hear you? Hi, my name is Dave Gerner. Thank you very much for the, the, the talks today, the opening statements. Um, I'm a PhD candidate uh, in literature at Simon Fraser, and my work uh, revolves around um, reconciliation politics and theory, so I come from a theoretical background, but I'm also very interested in how uh, oral traditions function um, in the TRC process right here. So how this, the oral history works um, in terms of reconciliation and how um, victims are called upon to give testimony um, to and how the oral works there. But I, what I'm interested in posing today is something I've been thinking about a lot is um, this question of the archive, um, which uh, obviously as um, students in the academy, the archive is a huge part of what we do. And I think in law, um, we can't 
I, I, our systems of law, European systems of law, function on this notion of the archive. The archive has to exist as this notion that legal tradition is built on what other people have said, which have been re reinforced by other people. And, this, and that itself is based around writing. And what I find so provocative about oral um, history, and this comes up in uh, Professor Miller's book a bit, is this idea of performance. Um, and I'm really interested in how performance and the archive are in conversation with one another. Because the performative, and I think um, Professor McCall's ideas about dialogue too, um, um, and I'm not the first one to argue this, are um, in opposition um, to the archive because they exist in the moment. Um, the, it, the oral history, it, it exists because I'm talking to you now in this place. It's something that can't be reproduced. It's something that can't be turned into the archive. Um, and I'm wondering, at least I think the archive as we now know it um, in, a, in a colonial state. And I'm wondering um, what the panel thinks about this discourse between the archive and performance or dialogue. Um, if there's room for us, um, for Canada to think um, the performance within the archive or if it's always going to be a, a, a sui generis claim. It's always going to be this sort of other claim that we can't actually incorporate. It's always just other to it. So I, I'm really just interested in how the, um, the panel thinks about the archive in relation to performances. Thank you. There, there was a question there and we have a trained panel of academic experts who will <laughs> answer the question. Well, actually, I, I wanted to uh, respond to your opening statement that did not have a question, um, but uh, about your um, research into the Truth and Reconciliation C Commission and, and how uh, testimony is being handled there. Um, there, there have been um, some, uh, some very um, severe repercussions uh, where people have, have given testimony in order to receive common experience payments and also other types of, uh, of payments relating to abuse in the residential schools. And the, uh, the repercussions have been very severe uh, within the community. Um, and in, in uh, the national events uh, organized by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, they have uh, attempted to put in safeguards for people to be able to tell their stories um, and be, be kept safe uh, following um, that process. And the uh, the cultural um, uh, uh, protocols uh, are uh, is a point of real contention. The 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 contrast between I guess uh, Western psychiatry and uh, cultural product protocols has created um, some severe repercussions. Um, now the TRC um, has stated that they want to take down every single solitary survivor story um, and uh, and in that way I guess honor um, those those experiences um, but I'm uh, the the words of uh, Mike Degagne who is the executive director at the Aboriginal Healing Foundation always echoes in my mind when he says how many feet of stories do we need you know what uh, he just he just asked the question, <laughs> and it's really it's really stayed um, with me that question. Um, and I think what's more important is to think about um, uh, what the next step might be. It is this search for truth in in a kind of a complete way um, a, a, of another violent. Uh, another source of violence, I suppose. So, so what other projects, again, um, could be uh, initiated by communities themselves um, to to safeguard these stories um, and to to tr you know, I guess transform that legacy? Well, I'm sorry, this idea that the archive is complete. Do you think you're saying yeah, that collected all true. the stories? Um, yeah. It's like Harvard's full apology. We've done all the business. Here. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's that's over, true. So there's no room for. Oh, so I did answer your question, yeah, after yeah. all. Oh, oh, excellent. <laughs> go, go ahead. Yeah. I would just like to make a, a very quick non-expert uh, observation, and that is, I, I would challenge the notion that an archive is necessarily written. I think understanding uh, some 
um, non-written systems of knowledge is precisely they are archives, they're just enacted and preserved in different ways. So, uh, and thinking about what those differences are, I think is, is, is worth, uh, worth a little time. So. Hi, uh, can I stand up? Sure. Uh, this, this will Sorry. be on the karaoke part. Yeah. Of <laughs> <laughs> I have trouble with my back. Sorry. And uh, plus, I'm just, it's, it's not polite to speak and, while you're sitting. Um, well, in uncertain contexts, of course. Um, so, the archive, and um, I spent 10 years at home on my reserve working on land claims, and basically I was borrowing half a dozen microfilm at a time from the National Archives, and going through it page by page, because they're not indexed, which is why a lot of people avoid them, the pre-confederation pre records. Um, and so in a sense, I felt like I exhausted that archive, at least in, our, in my own um, region. Um, so I think of myself as an archivist, among other things. And um, it took me several years of being surrounded by these treaty documents that I had plastered on my, on my office walls, um, which had totemic signatures on them, to realize it's not about the words. It's not about the alphabetical rendering. And, and this is one of my problems with, with Dalgamook, is I think that it reinforces this binary between um, literacy and orality. I don't think there, there's anyone who's purely literary or anyone who's purely uh, oral um, or ever was. Um, and it's only if you assume that literacy means uh, alphabetic rendering of texts um, that our people can be said to be illiterate or pre-literate. Um, because we could represent ideas and concepts um, through carving, through painting, through quill work, through um, song, through um, dance. And, and so it's a very narrow view, I think, of, of expression and knowledge to think it has to be put down in, uh, in writing. So my people were not preliterate or illiterate. I'm just struggling to learn to read the, the system of, um, of, of communication. And apart from sort of discovering, uh, you know, what it meant to have someone sign a treaty by drawing an otter on the parchment, um, the other thing I realized is the archive is our language. And there's such a thing as missionary linguistics, and um, I'm a complete amateur, um, but there are aspects of our language that have been lost over time, and those dictionaries are treasures. And you know what? A dictionary is a dialogic process because somebody's teaching somebody how to speak somebody's language. And, um, and so, I don't know how many linear feet I have of the dictionaries once they're all printed out, um, but um, really, really uh, rich uh, sources. And so I don't despair from the point of view of being able to access our traditions and make, um, not, not make them, but I'm persuaded of the power of our symbols and the power of our language, the power of our expressive um, culture. I'm just not sure I want to take it into court. Could we maybe have another student question? Uh, uh, hi, my name is Rick Oleden. I'm a PhD, among other things, a PhD student here at UBC. And uh, my work um, involves uh, a community that was evicted uh, from what is now Jasper National Park in 1910, of which I guess I'm a contaminated member of um, because of my work. And uh, I wanted to, to ask about you know, the bulk of relationships between the Canadian government and Aboriginal peoples uh, doesn't take place in a courtroom. It, in fact, takes place 
through bureaucrats who work for ministries, and, and that's really where most of this happens. And um, when uh, because of Pauli in 2004, the, the park's hand was forced to start meeting with us. And so uh, the, the families that were evicted, uh, you know, got the elders together, and we started meeting with parks. And what we would do is we would go through meetings and kind of highlight agenda items. And then in the evenings, the elders, because they were were all spoke Cree, some of them only spoke Cree, uh, would discuss these issues of which I recorded in case some of the younger members challenged what was happening. And they would come to a consensus of what they wanted to happen with parks. And some of these things they came to were actually, um, I think, hard for parks to hear because they spoke of land claims and, and reconciliation and stuff. And then we would start getting letters back occasionally from the Department of Justice. And so we were meeting with people who had access to government lawyers who would respond to us whenever the questions became difficult. And, um, and through the process of the years, um, that, that has changed. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not involved anymore for a whole variety of reasons. But what happens now is they have an interpreter come in. And every time an elder talks, at that moment, it's interpreted into English. And that's what uh, comes out in the minutes. Previously, the recording would come out in the minutes, and that would be housed both with me and with Parks. And, and so now you don't actually have a consensus anymore. And the way things are moving, none of these questions, none of these pointed questions are actually ever uh, come to the floor anymore. And I was just wondering if you would talk about that and, and how those processes work. And, um, you know, I don't want to sort of challenge the entire Canadian government. Certainly, the Jasper Field Unit is acting in a way that I, I don't consider uh, very moral. I'm just standing. Okay. Well, well, I was just going to say that um, that Professor Miller's book is 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 does give you uh, a very vivid picture of those layers of the bureaucracy you speak of, and uh, I believe he interviewed um, extensively, you know, court researchers, you know, a, a whole. A whole gang of of uh, employees who are uh, who have are going through this this testimony and cherry picking is the metaphor he uses cherry picking the information that will fit and one person says oh yeah this stuff is slag and this stuff is golden but then in another context it might be reversed but by then you know the these this very rigid process of of um, categorizing and um, datifying um, the oral history has has already occurred. But I'm just stealing your ideas. So. <laughs> um, I, I don't have a useful comment, Rick, because you and I talk about this all the time. <laughs> uh, I, I, but I am thinking of one thing. A guy named Don Barr wrote an article about um, tribal courts in the U.S and about whether the uh, English version is the same law as the uh, Aboriginal language version and how it really might not be. And so which version actually holds uh, uh, weight in those tribal courts. And so you're talking about a kind of slippage in language translation problem. But I think you're thinking of it as a specific strategy of Crown or Parks in this case. And um, you're just making me feel bad. <laughs> Not really. I really am standing because my back hurts. Not. The language is really, really powerful, and it's all that's coming up. So I got a caution out of my back. I can speak louder. <laughs> Is this better? Yeah, okay. Um, and I think anytime anyone's speaking in their uh, language, there's so many communities now that have so few speakers, I just, we should be running a tape recorder all the time, right? It's like, I wish I had a tape recorder every time I hear someone pray or sing or, you know, just because you want to save it because you realize how fast we're losing our speakers. And, um, you know, the Anishinaabek um, 
were one of the most widespread language groups in North America, and we were one of three that people thought might survive the century. And But I know some linguists from our own communities who are not optimistic. Um, and so, um, recording things are in value just just for the, for for themselves, and then it's a whole other question if you've got time to translate it and actually put put it to to, to use in a, in any particular um, um, proceedings. Um, but it reminded me of a of something. Um, <coughs> That, that might work in terms of insulating elders, which is even even for elders um, that can speak English as their mother tongue, or even we have some elders in our community now who don't, the English is their first language. Um, I think we should always use a person who functions as an interpreter so that the elder's never on the spot. Right and open to the direct questioning, the the person who's used to how rude people can be actually takes the question like physically. Right, you take it, and then you go and politely you say, "Well, they're asking this, right? Sorry, but you know. and then they'll give them an answer, and then you go back and answer, right? And if they interrupt you, you can interrupt them. But this idea that um, our, our elders, uh, you know, so so interpreters can do that. Uh, and people accept the use of interpreters where there's a language divide, but I think where there's a culture divide, if we had someone um, like myself, for instance, who I, I consider myself bicultural and trained legally, but also, you know, legally, Canadian legally, and, and otherwise, um, that we, we can be buffers of a sort. Um, but that would, that would take, you know, the court adjusting to a whole bunch of things to let that happen, because usually it's only, you only get a translator if, if the court can't really understand what the person wants to tell the court, and that's not what we need these, these um, buffers for. Perhaps we could open the floor more generally to questions. And if you are a student who didn't ask a question that you have, of course, you're not prohibited from entering the, uh, the open round of questioning either. But um, someone have a question for our panel? And uh, maybe I'll be the, um, this is so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be the mic guy. So did you have a question? Or? Yeah. Would you come up with if you have a question? Sure. Yeah. Maybe, uh, if you could come up here, we can keep the mic for the panel. Hi, my name is Ben Gerls. I'm a MA candidate at SFU in English as well. And uh, I think my question is more maybe of a disciplinary question between anthropology and English, but I'm interested. Um, in both of your books, you represent in different ways forms, different forms and different reasons for collaborative authorship um, and at different stages of um, composition processes. And I'm interested, interested in the general tension between um, legal and aesthetic in your two books. Um, and wondering, I guess, more generally, is there a place for aesthetic principles or strategies in legal contexts? <laughs> So what I mean is like flexibility, ambiguity. Um, in your chapter on Inuit ways of knowing and Isuma, um, you talk about um, you talk about strategies of partial translation, which gets back to some of the things um, we've been talking about so far today, as a way of navigating, you know, uh, preserving some sort of some sort of sense that defies pure ethnography, you know, pure translation, and that that idea is aesthetically valuable in some way. But the impulse in most legal contexts is total translation. Mm -hmm. You want to get as precise as, as precise as possible. But it seems like the aesthetic impulse is not only, like it seems necessary in, in some contexts. So I'm interested in, in if you can speak to what the role of aesthetics might be in that way. I'm sure we'd all like to have elegance and beauty in our laws, but... Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> that's a really hard question. Um, is there room in the courtroom for ambiguity and uh, 
Yeah, ambi- let's just say complexity and ambiguity. I, I really, I'm not so sure about that. I, my sense is no, um, but <laughs> um, but I, but that's why I'm interested in um, perhaps um, parallel proceedings in which a, a, a consensual model might be used. Um, in the justice system, we do have some um, initiatives uh, called restorative justice, uh, where victims and perpetrators meet on very different terms than they do in the in the conventional courtroom. And I'm wondering if if a similar um, process, a parallel process, could be developed. As I mentioned earlier, when you create parallel um, proceedings, you know all sorts of problems develop. Take, for example. Um, uh, conventional Western medicine and then you have what you want to call alternative medicine or you want to call it complementary medicine and all the the funding uh, debacle that falls from that and all the many other issues that um, you may have encountered in your daily lives and I think the same similar problems develop however I think that nevertheless uh, a, a, an alternative or complementary system um, based on a consensus model uh, might be a possibility. And again, um, the, the concept that I try to develop is collaborative authorship, um, keeping the tension between those two terms, collaboration and authorship, very very strong, where the authorship is about respecting and acknowledging the cultural property that the stories represent, and collaboration is about an exchange between people. Well, I want to say that I'm glad, Sophie, you raised the idea of new initiatives. There's all kinds of things that have been undertaken in the last several years in our own legal system here. I would like to suggest, however, that we bring back a tradition from Anglo-Saxon law, namely the ordeal. Because I would like to see the crown seize the bar of molten lead to see whether they're telling the truth. <laughs> and anyhow, that's a suggestion. Uh, we're, we are circling around the word the commensurability and uh, ultimately the question is can we understand each other or is it the gap too great? And it's true that in the court a, a stumbling block has been the fact that oral tradition, oral, oral historians, let's say, uh, tell things that operate at multiple scales of time, multiple um, scales of ideas, and we've seen, you know, stumbling blocks for that. But uh, so I'm just restating my own proposition that uh, we needn't decide, we, we don't have to have a full engagement so that the deepest ontological understandings are explored. Uh, we can have an understanding that operates maybe lesser than that, but sufficient to uh, have uh, mutuality uh, of outcome. And uh, by the way, just as another little technique, I'm thinking about uh, the So Happy Fishing ca case in Oregon, where Barbara Lane uh, was actually appointed as a um, I've forgotten what she was called, but she acted as expert for both the equivalent of the crown and the tribes. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's one little kind of tinkering with the system so that a mutual narrative uh, can emerge. So <clears throat> talking about ambiguity reminds me of burden of proof. And the conventional divide in um, the... English common law is as between um, a civil standard of proof and a criminal standard of proof. And so to win a case as a plaintiff in a civil suit, you need to prove your case on a balance of probabilities, which sounds like there's a bit of room for ambiguity. Um, for the Crown to win a case in a criminal context, you um, have to be convinced that the person is guilty as charged beyond a reasonable doubt. And they're meant to be different standards. And one of the things that perplexes me <laughs> is um, the courts don't pay attention to those standards in Section 35 adjudication. And I don't know that anyone's really taken a close look at that yet. Um, but 
Justice Binney, um, now retired, Mr. Binney again, um, or maybe we still have to call him his honor. <laughs> he wrote a, a judgment in Marshall, which gave me hope. And then, and then he wrote, we wake him. It's like, how can the same person do that? It's like Justice McLaughlin writing the dissent in Vanderpeet. And then she dissented in Marshall. But anyway, um, but one of the things that Justice Binney had to say, and apparently his spouse is a historian, so he knows something about how historians operate, he says, judges don't have the luxury of historians, of like not really, you know, leaving everything nuanced and unfolding, and, and that they have to make a decision at the end of the day, right? Somebody wins, somebody loses, whether it's on the balance of probabilities or beyond a reasonable doubt. And, and, Law professors say sometimes, and treaty negotiators say, it's all about certainty, right, and predictability. And so there's not, there's not meant to be as much room for ambiguity as there really is. And one of the problems, somebody mentioned sui generis, which drives me crazy, um, <laughs> is we get unhinged from any doctrinal mooring. Um, we can't count on trust law. <laughs> we we can't count on conventional you know interpretations in other areas of the law because we're in a class of our own right and so there's ways in which the certainty that law provides doesn't apply to us and the standards don't seem um, to be as clearly um, applicable um, so there's a great article though speaking of anthropology by Mary Black Rogers um, called percept ambiguity. And if you want an ambiguous uh, approach to life, you know, in, in my culture, you know, all kinds of things that people say are inanimate, we think are animate. And people with power, other than her, human persons and, and, and human persons, are capable of transforming. And so you're never really sure. <laughs> Another question. Uh, would you like to come up and pose it? Uh, my name is uh, Grace Lisiu Wu, and I have a doctorate in international law from the University of Montreal that's been also published by UBC Press under the title Ghost Dancing with Colonialism. It's basically a study of all of the Supreme Court of Canada's Section 35 decisions. And the question that I will be asking the panel has to do with um, the extent to which they think that the court is creating a kind of perversion of knowledge. Um, to me, as a non-Aboriginal person, this perversion of knowledge is an attack on human knowledge globally, because I think that the knowledge that the original nations have and had is very important. Um, I think there's a real difficulty with the courts. Um, if you read the Dalgamuk decision, um, despite the fact that there were hundreds of days of presentation of indigenous knowledge, there's no sign of it in the judgment. They say they accept oral history, but you don't get any sense that they took any of it in. Um, I think the courts are blind to the issues that are important to the original nations, of which there are several, and they're not all the same. Um, and because of that blindness, um, I don't know, they didn't even seem to see any of the information that was in Delgamuk uh, that must have been given at the first level. Um, I, I'm not sure that following an English model would uh, work. I, I think all cultures are like living trees and that transform through time. Uh, the Supreme Court doesn't seem willing to accept that um, with Van Der Peet. Um, but I don't think having a Supreme, 
an Aboriginal person on the Supreme Court is going to solve it. To begin with, there's so many nations with different perspectives that have gotten glommed together to make the Aboriginal category or the Indian status category. Um, and the other thing is that in order to get to that level, you have to be so thoroughly indoctrinated in the culture that the court represents that you don't have a chance to learn anything about whatever culture your ancestors come from. Um, I, don't, I also have some caveats about this kind of way that once you get it on paper, um, it's the fact and it's the law, because understanding is different from one time to another in history, just as it is between different communities. There are different values that are important and um, different constellations of interests that are important. So when you take something to the Supreme Court, um, all the issues are changed. They might be completely irrelevant to the culture that, whose uh, information the court's trying to listen to. Um, but outside the area of Indigenous law, um, I think uh, Bruce Miller suggested that um, one could use a kind of ancient document concept, uh, that the idea that if it's in an ancient document, it must be true. But there's serious problems with that. Um, I did some research on women's issues at one time, and there was a document called the Mirror of Justice. And it was taken from that document that it was backed that uh, women didn't have status to be judges or to be in the court. But actually, the people that really did research on the Mirror of Justice has said it was supposed to be a farce, a parody. It was supposed to make me people laugh and did at one time. But a few centuries later in our courts, it was taken as the truth. I think there's a real danger of us misinterpreting original cultures. There's another uh, couple of books written by UBC Press that I found really interesting, um, books by Richard Atlio uh, about what he called Sawak. And it was interesting to me because it started to give me a little bit of understanding of what I was missing. And it sort of makes me know that if I was a judge, I would not really be able to interpret any indigenous culture. As I sort of looked at those stories as if they were sort of cute, interesting stories about animals. And it was only as I read his book that I began to see that there was um, a philosophical depth to it that I completely missed any other time before that I'd read those stories. So yeah. I think there's a danger of people taking a story from an indigenous nation and trying to make it concrete in a way that might be totally incorrect. So um, that's my question. I'm interested in your observations on how the court perverts indigenous knowledge. Thank you. Before uh, turning the mic to um, our panelists to um, see if they have a response to that, um, I, thank you for bringing up the, um, referring to those books at the end. I, I think uh, um, Alio's book is one of the ones on the table out here in, in a few minutes uh, when we wrap up with the formal part of our um, panel here, uh, there is the opportunity to go out and have a look at some of these books, and I, I think uh, you'll find it uh, worth your time to do that. But does anyone have a response to that? I've got an observation. It's not, this isn't going to be a satisfying answer for you. Of course that happens. But one thing we're missing here is incrementality. There's all kinds of small-scale victories. I've been party to them. And uh, so we can't overlook that. In, in sort of looking for a home run here, I, here either, and and uh, if we want to get entirely negative, uh, then then we we can go have a party. Might as well then. Well, um, yeah, there's a lot. There was a lot going on in that in that uh, comment and question. Um, I do agree that decontextualizing and recontextualizing stories 
transform them, absolutely. Um, at the same time, uh, 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 stories can be recontextualized again uh, within within community protocols. Um, but just, just to put that aside, I wanted to also respond to your question about whether it would make a difference if Aboriginal people were a part of, uh, if Aboriginal people were judges and lawyers. And I actually do think that will will create a profound change. I see it in, in the context of my own university, for example, where I have um, Aboriginal colleagues um, across the country, and their numbers are very small, but their impact is huge. And I, I, uh, I think that the, these, these changes are significant. Now, universities can use those changes uh, cynically by you know, putting up posters of uh, Aboriginal people or <laughs> Aboriginal professors um, to look like um, things have changed, but um, but the fact is that uh, these these changes do add up and they do have a, a big impact. And I'm I'm very grateful for for being in a time when these changes are occurring. I, I just want to clarify. I, I think we need more comments. Um, to suggest in any sense that Aboriginal people should go to law school. Okay. <laughs> Every time there's a vacancy in the Supreme Court of Canada in the last 10 years, there's been a call by the Canadian Bar Association, obviously the Indigenous Bar Association, a number of other uh, um, participants in the bar, uh, which is an interesting word, um, to, uh, to appoint an Aboriginal judge. And um, and you know what, I think John Burroughs will be a great judge. <laughs> and Mary Ellen Trapel, right? It's like, um, and I'm, I have to decide whether I'm really ever gonna publish what I wanna say about a few of the justices. Um, because in, in that case, I'll never show up in court or be on anyone's list, not that I <laughs> really wanna be. Um, but, uh, one of the struggles I'm having now, because I have a manuscript that's long overdue, it's really embarrassing to see all these people who were, I met them at author's receptions and their books are all out and, and um, mine isn't. And um, one of the things I'm struggling with is whether to talk about narratives as history, as tradition, as law. And to me, law is the biggest reach and the, the most likely to affront the judges. And I, I'm realizing more and more I'm not speaking to judges anymore. So um, one of the things that's happened in the court is this whole idea that why does, why does our history become evidence, right? Why are our traditions evidence? And they have law. They have statutes. And Robert Williams Jr. is a great, amazing Aboriginal uh, Native American academic down at the University of Arizona, and he has written an amazing book called Like a Loaded Weapon. And he talks about the American federal Indian law as being juris-pathic. Juris-pathic? It kills, right? Some systems of law kill other systems of law. And so, whether we want to try to resuscitate our laws and take them in, and that's not going to happen unless there's an Aboriginal judge on a bench somewhere. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just make um, maybe a final observation uh, that has to do with the, the um, expertise. We've had the opportunity to hear this afternoon and the work that's gone into these books, but also the work that uh, all of our panelists do on a daily basis. And um, I think this is a field that's very, as you can see, uh, and as you probably already knew uh, before you came here, that's extremely complex. And in the absence of good understanding, uh, of the um, issues that we've been talking about today. And in the absence of real expertise that can challenge um, less expert and more opportunistic work, we will all be in a much worse situation. And that's why it's, uh, 
uh, a real pleasure to have the opportunity to hear from people who have thought uh, carefully about these matters and have taken uh, their expertise into not only the arena of scholarship and understanding and academics, but also into court where it has mattered in the past. Um, and where your interest in understanding more thoroughly these issues is equally important. Um, understanding is better than ignorance. And this is an arena in which that is true in, uh, in ways that are, that are really hard to equal. So I really want to um, ask you to join me in appreciating the work that, um, of, these, uh, of our panelists and their uh, conversation today. And I also want to thank you for coming and being part of it. And hopefully you'll have a chance to talk with them and to have a look at the books that uh, they've written and the other ones that are on display in the lobby. by fast.